Okay, let's open the word of prayer and just ready to receive here. Father, we just thank you for thank you for all your myriad blessings and for your word that will that will guide us and instruct us in all things. Let the words that are spoken here be your words. Let them just land a seed on fertile ground. It will speak into our lives in some way, both both today and in the and in the years to come. However much time you have we have with you, Lord, in this earth. Just give us fresh insight into you and fresh insight into ourselves. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, first off, I'm going to ask you if you've got a Bible to turn with me to the book of what's John's first epistle, 1 John chapter 4. And while you're searching for that, because it uh, takes a little bit of time to find it, I'm going to set this up for you. I um, heard a bit of discussion just as we were getting started about the vote that's going on in Ukraine. And the other day down in the Lord's Reign, we get, we get talking about all sorts of things down there. And one of the front page stories that came out was about fracking. About the, um, you know, the, the, the method of getting natural gas out of the ground by flushing down really high pressure water and sand and oil and so forth. It's been going around for a long time, but the provincial government is planning to expand all that and bring in, you know, gazillions of dollars and everyone's going to be happy because of all the money that comes in, right? However, front page story in the paper dealt with the health effects because it's been going on for some time. People are talking about what it's doing to their health. And so there's a lot of concern about that. There's concern about all sorts of things in the world. Climate change, global warming, sexually transmitted diseases, airborne transmitted diseases, having had your flu shot, all sorts of things that strike fear into us, and of course the ever-present possibility of World War III breaking out in Eastern Ukraine. I mean, there's, or the Middle East, or South Sudan, or Nigeria, or take your pick. There's a lot of things going on that people get scared of, and overarching all of this, is the sense that all the decisions are being made someplace else. That no matter what, for instance, about fracking, no matter what scientists say, no matter what health experts say, no matter what the people say, if they want to go, no us, we don't want this to happen, the decision has already been made and sucks to be us. Okay? That's called fear. And if you look at newspapers over a year, front page stories generally tend to be fear-based. 90% of them have got something to do with fear. The other 10% have to do with the bank of Canucks. <laughs> and in fact, Canucks stories get into the other 90% as well. We'll let that one drop. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, there is so much in the world that gets us to be afraid. Around here, gentrification is the big boogie now. People are afraid, what's going to happen? I'm going to get pushed out of my home. Am I going to have to move someplace else? Am I going to be homeless because some developer is going to come in? All of this stuff builds up into fear. But fear <laughs> is not of God. Fear is not something God wants us to walk in. And when we walk in fear, we're focusing so much on what might happen on something bad that's going on, and our focus comes off the good that God can work in any situation. So if you're in uh, 1 John chapter 4, verse 7, here's what he writes. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God in any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him, and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. 
Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. So what's the antidote to fear? Uh, love. love. It's the word that you hear over and over and over again in that passage. Love, love, love. And as we love one another, according to the way that Jesus calls us, as we love one another, then fear gets driven out. Fear doesn't have a chance when we walk in love. So what does that mean if we are surrounded by all these things around us that cause us to fear? You walk in love. You walk in love. You, you, you. When you love someone, you give them the benefit of the doubt. When you love someone, you do what Jesus did on the cross, is you forgive them because you assume that they don't know what they're doing if they're doing something to you. When you love someone, you remove the personal aspect about anything that's being done. Because when we fear something, we're generally afraid for what it's going to do to us. We're afraid for our skin, for our homes, for our next meal, for our jobs, for our income, for our lives. Didn't Jesus take away fear of death by conquering death on the cross and then by being resurrected? Sure he did. Otherwise, what was he doing it all for? He takes away that fear from us because he loved us and God loves us. Check this out. If we love our brother, John says, God abides in us. In other words, God sits in us. God rests in us. He lives in us when we love others. So when we love others, we can't fear. And Jesus says, if you love your friends and hate your enemies, how does that make you any better than anybody else? What he says is, love your enemies. Pray for those who use you despitefully. Bless those who curse you. If someone lays a curse on you, bless them. Don't try to curse them back. Bless them. And if you feel that something is going on in a government, in a situation that doesn't seem right, don't fret about how to go about making it right because all you're doing is making it right in your eyes. What you need to do is call God into the situation because quite frankly, we're powerless. We have no power. We are mere human beings. We were created to be God's servants. We were created to take care of his creation. That's what we were put on this earth for. And we are put on this earth to take care of one another. So if we start focusing on fear of being afraid of what happens, then we're not loving others. We're not reaching out to others. Let me give you an example. Supposing I were to lift up myself. Pray for myself. Love myself. How many people are lifting up me? One. Okay. But supposing I were to lift up Andrew and Ian and Nilo and Bill and Bob and Tom and James and other James and Anthony and Herbie and all the others that are here. And you all lifted up me and lifted up everybody else who was here. Well, then how many do I have lifting me up? You see? How many do I have li loving me and caring for me? A whole lot of people. And as you start doing that, you are now releasing God into the situation. You see, fear is not of God. So what does that mean? Fear is of the devil, right? So if we walk in love, I'm not going to make a prediction about what will manifest in the, in the human realm. But what I do know is this. If we walk in love, then we are bringing 
God into the picture. If God abides in us, then what happens when we walk into a room? God walks into the room. And anybody else who's walking in love, God walks into that room. So now all of a sudden, it's not Andrew walking into a room, who as a human being can only do so much, or Tom, who as a human being can only do so much, but it is God who is coming in. It is God who abides in us, who takes over the situation. <laughs> now we say we walk in love. We take away the personal aspect. We assume that whoever is there is doing what they think is the right thing to do, and God, you take over. If this situation is wrong, you deal with it, because I don't have the power. And in fact, I have the smarts to say what a good situation is, what the right situation is. You can look at something and say, that's not right, but how do you fix it? What looks right to us? As humans, all we can see is what looks wrong, quite frankly. How many times have we wanted something to go well for ourselves, and it has, and it's blown up in our face? I can think of times when I went after a promotion, I tried to force the hand and make it happen. In fact, even, even as, a, as, as a saved Christian, I would, I would pray for this promotion to come through. And it would blow up in my face. Why? Because it wasn't God's will. But if you release God's will into it by walking in love, by, by, by considering everybody else ahead of you, and by considering God above all, then God gets a crack at that situation. He gets a chance to deal with it. And you know that whatever he does is going to be right. <clears throat> and how many times have we seen things that are wrong, or seem wrong to us, that happen either because they stop something worse from happening, or because we need to go through that experience. You know, being a Christian doesn't necessarily mean everything is going to go right for you all the time. Amen? Amen. Yeah. So, but what happens is, you take that experience, if something feels wrong about it, you take it to the cross. If you need to be forgiven for something, you ask God or whomever to forgive you, and you move forward. You move forward in your new life, in your new, in, 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 in your new person, and you learn something from it. And then it turns into something that's God's glory. But God's glory can be found in the darkest places, so long as you look for it. So long as you assume it's going to be there somewhere. So that's what he says about love. That's what he says about combating fear. If you walk in fear, you're like the proverbial deer in the headlights. You get frozen. That's what's so bad about fear, is it freezes us. It freezes us into inaction, and then when we finally do something, it's often going to be the wrong action. We often do something, and it goes wrong. It makes things worse. It's like... The old saying, if you open up a can of worms, the only way to recan them is to get a bigger can. And if you can't find that bigger can for your worms, then you've got a whole big problem right there. So you do the wrong thing. That's what happens if you're walking in fear. But if you're walking in love, if you're placing God first, everybody else second, yourself somewhere below the church cat, or dog in this case, <laughs> if you do that, then God <laughs> comes into the situation and whatever he comes up with, whatever he sends, is going to be for his glory. When Lazarus died, and Jesus was called to come and to come and heal him, to come and raise him, well, eventually raise him up, he was called to heal him. And Jesus turned to his disciples and he said, Lazarus is dead, and I am glad. Now let's finish the sentence. Lazarus was dead, and I am glad for your sakes that you would see the glory of God manifest. Okay? Sometimes you've got to have those setbacks to see where God's glory is. Otherwise, what's the use of God's glory? What's the use of forgiveness? What's the use of grace if there isn't dark periods we go through? What's the use of, of God having glory if there isn't something that doesn't glorify Him? Isn't that something like in order for an arrow to shoot forward, you have to pull it back first? Not quite where I was going with that one, but yeah, okay. There, there is something to that. It's the action-reaction thing. I'm thinking more in terms of light versus dark. Okay. And, and, and good versus evil. Evil versus good. If there's no evil in the world, how would you know what good is? Right? So when we've got situations that seem to call for us to be afraid of what's going on, yeah, we're powerless. We are, we are not made to have this kind of authority in our own strength. 
What we do have is the Holy Spirit. What we do have is this is a spirit that God has given us, which casts out fear. The thing is, when you're dealing with a situation like that, I'm going to bring this into worldly terms now. When you're dealing with situations where it looks like you've got a government that's corrupt, where it looks like you've got organizations that have already made the decision, maybe there is some secret cabal way up there that's pulling the strings on puppets and so forth. Don't let yourself start talking about that. Don't let yourself get into that because Jesus says that if you so much as call someone a fool, you're in danger. If you hate your brother without cause, you're a murderer already. If you've already got that thought in your mind. If you call someone a name, you are just as good as killing them. Because they're a child of God, too. We're not so darn special, those of us in this room, that other people out there are children of God as well. So we have to remember that we are not any better or any worse than those out there. Even if there is a secret cabal, they're children of God as well, whether they want to be or not. So we need to keep that in mind. As long as we keep steering the course towards love, towards understanding that we are all children of God, we are all in this planet together, we are all moving forward in this, in this instance, well then, God can start working miracles on people. Miracles happen. Many of you know the story of the Lord's reign, how that was a total miracle. How it went from zero dollars to getting the thing built. And the fact of the matter is, <coughs> excuse me, and the fact of the matter is, when God works a miracle and makes it happen in His way, it is far greater than anything we could ever think of. So consider this. You look at a situation, you figure it's bad, you figure it's beyond your control, and you want to fix it. Or, you give it to God. Now I know that there are people who would love to say, Christians need to have backbone, not wishbone. You may have heard that. <coughs> Prayer, giving it to God, is not wishing. It's not wishful thinking. In fact, sometimes it takes more backbone to stand on the word than to, to, to get stuck in and try to fix the situation and maybe, just maybe, get it wrong because you got the wrong solution. So, it's not a question of, it's not a question of wishing. It's a question of letting God do his thing and understanding where we are in him. There is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. Don't ask me how that happens. It does. Because if you're walking in love towards somebody, even if it's someone that you think is going to mug you, and you walk in love towards that person, you watch how the hand of God comes down to that situation and deals with it. I'm not going to say it's going to prevent the mugging. I don't know. Sometimes it even offers, offers an opportunity to witness. Sometimes you get an opportunity to witness, exactly. But however that works out, God's hand goes on it and allows you to walk in His way. And as we walk in His way, others become influenced. Bill said, it's witness. We become walking witnesses to God. Walking witnesses to the power of love. Remember the facets of love. It's patient. It's kind. It's not self-seeking. It conquers all. God is love. God is patient. God is kind. God doesn't seek after his own. He seeks after his own people. He wants his people to seek him. And he conquers all. So we've got we to gotta understand that and live with that. We are going through times now that Jesus warned us about. He warned us that we would have all these different conspiracies coming up, all these different disasters happening, all these areas where the love of many grows cold, don't let your love grow cold. Don't be part of that prophecy. Because we have a choice to not be part of that prophecy. We have a choice to allow our love to burn even stronger towards those whose love is getting cold, towards those who need it. Not just the needy, but the people who are cast as the villains in these pieces. You start reaching out, you want to talk about gentrification, start reaching out towards developers. With love, not with 
Not with barricades, not with, with, with calumny, not with, with hatred. But reach out with love. That's going to attract more people and bring them around to your point of view or to God's point of view, which is always somewhere between my point of view and the other guy's point of view. Trust me. Yeah. But it will be the right point of view. It will be the right thing. Rather than all, always, always head bite over everything. Don't walk in fear. The other beautiful thing here about, or another beautiful thing here about this passage, when he talks about walking in love, check this out. Verse 17, love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. That's part one. Boldness in the day of judgment. If we are walking in love, then when judgment day comes, whether it's the last trumpet and Jesus riding in on a cloud, or whether it's our last day, you know, if the Lord tarries, as they say, and we wind up facing the big sir ourselves, which we will, well, we'll be able to do it with boldness. Boldness. Not like sniveling, cowering mice going up to him going, oh, please, Lord, please, don't, don't, don't send me off to hell. But being able to say, yes, Lord, I love my brother. I did good for people. I loved others. I walked in your ways as much as I could. And I believe that Jesus Christ died for my sins and was propitiation for my sins. I believe that, Lord. That's going to be your fast track right into the kingdom of heaven, praise God. It will be. So if we can do that, facing him on the judgment day with boldness, how much more can we do with picky things happening in the world? How much more will we be able to do at that point? We'll be powerhouses in this world because we've got God in us and we're operating in love. Think about that. Does any one of us here has got that? Receive that love. Walk in that love. Keep asking yourself, am I walking in love? Is what I'm about to say a loving remark? As Jerry Savelle has said, if you can't speak the word of God, shut up. So am I speaking the word of God? Even if I'm speaking the word of God with an intention of, quote-unquote, edifying people, you know, sort of telling them something, or, as some would say, calling them on their stuff. Even if it's that, is it in love? Is it really in love? Does it really have to be said? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And if the heart is filled with love, then you're going to know exactly what to say to someone, and how to say it, or when to say it at all. So that's the sort of thing that we can do and we become those kind of powerhouses. Every one of us here can do that. As I say, if we have boldness in the day of judgment, what more is it going to be like when we have to face a debt collector? That sort of thing. But here's the other part that I love from this verse, verse 17. As he is, so are we in this world. Think about it. As God is, so are we in this world. If we have love operating in us, God abiding in us, and this is one I've really got to meditate on because I smell another sermon coming on about the other part where he says, we abide in God? Think about that one. Does that necessarily mean, I mean, we, we hear Psalm, Psalm 91, is it, that says that he who abides in the, shall abide in the shadow of the Almighty? Okay, that's the shadow. John says, we abide in the Almighty. That's one, to, that's, that's one for some homework to take on with you. Just think about what does that mean. But as he is, so are we in this world. So as God is all-powerful over the universe, when we are walking in love, <clears throat> we are walking truly as God intended us to be, we have Tremendous power that we can't even think of. I know, that's the sort of thing that gets people saying heresy and holding up little wooden crosses and saying, oh, this person is of the devil because he's saying we're God's. Well, I don't know. Is John of the devil? I don't think so. So what's he mean by that? What he means by that is, I think what he means by that is, if we're walking in love, nothing can stop us. Nothing can stop us from healing the sick. Nothing can stop us from binding the brokenhearted. Nothing can stop us from doing miracles. On people. Greater works than these, Jesus says, we'll be able to do for those who believe in his name. Oh my goodness. Look what, a, what, what that means then. And we can do it. 
Don't be afraid of that one. That's one the devil wants to throw at you too. Don't be afraid. You think you might look like a fool sometime if you go to somebody and say, be healed in the name of Jesus Christ. So if nothing happens. I can tell you right now, there are like three or four people that I've walked up to put a hand on their knee or a hand on their shoulder or whatever, and guess what? Suddenly the pain is not there anymore. My, my back? Your, your back? Yeah, my okay. back. Yes, that's right. There was that. Um, there was a brother who had... Uh, can I move my mic up a bit? Yeah. Like this? Oh! <laughs> Sorry, James. <laughs> I got like I got like five minutes left. He's asking me now. Can I move my mic? Up? <laughs> anyway, gladly I will move my mic up so that then the people downstairs can hear my voice. There, how's that? All right. Um, where, where? Or it's from above. <laughs> Yeah. There's no fish down there. Yeah, that's a whole other joke. Okay, let's let's let's, let's <laughs> zero back in on this here. Um, where was I? Yeah. Um, Healing sick. Thank you. Yeah. There are times you can do that. There are times when when you're able to do that. And don't worry if it doesn't seem to work right off the bat, because God works in His time. God works in ways that. <laughs> You start with the faith, and it, takes, it could take a few years before the manifestation. So don't worry about that. The fact is, you're doing it. The fact is, you're reaching out. And you're, you're actually putting your faith on the line to pray for somebody. Because you're not moving in love. You're not doing it so people go around and say, Oh, wow, what a, what a great man of God he is. What a great soothsayer. What a great healer he is. You know, that can start to get you a little bit... Uh, yeah, a, a, a little bit wound up in your own power. It's not your power. And just watch how quickly it goes away from you if you start doing it that way. But if you're doing it for the manifestation of God's glory, if you're doing that as a testimony to people to say, look, this is what I believe. And really, what to say a prayer over somebody really hurts when you do it, you know? So the devil's going to try to get in there and try to tell you things that, uh, you know, oh, well, you're going to look pretty silly if this doesn't work. I remember uh, John Boyd, who's the uh, senior pastor at West Point, my home church, and just before Christmas, he was dropping off some donations for Canuck Place. And the principal of the school where he was dropping it off said, can you, can you step in here for a moment? And it was the family of this little boy who was in Canuck Place, and he was terribly, terribly ill. And the principal said, will you pray for their little boy? This is a public school. Amen. The principal is Muslim, but she knew that John's a pastor, and said, will you come in? And John had that little thing go off in the back of his head. This might not work, they might not receive it. But what also he heard was, yeah, but what if it does? So they prayed. The little boy didn't make it to Christmas, unfortunately. But there were other things that have started sort of a cascading result. Maybe the result wasn't what people thought they were going to get from the prayer. But the fact that John reached out in love, responded to the call, that's now stuck with the parents. The parents have been in touch with John since then. I don't know where things are at now. But it was, and, and quite frankly, it was an incredible move of boldness on the part of the teacher, the part of the principal. Because she, she closed the door, but she said to her assistant outside, this is out of hours right now. And closed the door. You know, heaven help us if the public school system were to actually allow discussion of the, the C word. Christ, you know. Anyway, that's one of these cases where maybe it doesn't work that first time. But how do you know what the seed is <laughs> sown? Well, so you've got to sow the seed. Then you've got to do it in love. If you're walking in love, you will get that prompt. You'll know exactly what to do. Maybe it's not prayer. Maybe it's not prayer right on the spot. Maybe it's prayer off to the side. But the fact of the matter is, once you are walking in love, you are no longer walking in fear. You no longer have to worry. They say worry is a sin. That's right, it is. Because it assumes that God is not going to come through. 
that God can't provide. Fear and faith, oddly enough, are about the same thing. Fear is the belief, usually in the absence of any evidence to support it, that God will not come through for you. Faith is the belief, in the absence of any evidence to support it, that God will come through for you. So, you know, given the choice, which would you rather go for? I would rather go for the faith part, that something good is going to happen, even if I can't see it right now. And that's part of the marvel of God, is that you can't see what he's got cooking. He's the one who knows the beginning from the end. He's the one who knows where we're going and what we're supposed to do. And he's the one who commands us, all we have to do is love. All we have to do is put everyone else first. All we have to do is love him. And it's counterintuitive. It goes against our whole being. Our whole fleshly being says, if someone does something to you, do something back. You hit me, I hit you. You hit me back, I hit you harder. I hit you harder, you come at me with a knife. You know how that works, all right? But instead, Jesus says, you hit me, okay, I'll give you the other cheek and have a crack at that too. You, you steal my, my coat, I'll give you my overcoat as well. You want to frog march me for one mile, you can frog march me for two miles. You know, this is the sort of thing that Jesus calls us to do, to, to defang what Satan wants. Satan wants us at, at one another's throats. Satan wants us afraid of things. Satan wants us frozen because we don't know what to do. When we walk in love, God wants us to move ahead. God wants us to do the things that, that we are supposed to do. God wants us to have all these wonderful blessings. But if we don't love others, how can we say we love God? Which is the other thing that John says in that in that passage. If someone says, I love God, but hates his brother, he's a liar. Because how can you love someone you haven't seen if you can't love what you can't see? So that gets us out of this fear cycle. And it removes the one thing the devil has over us, which is making us scared for something. It removes that, that, that sense of, of insecurity, because now we're placing our trust. By loving others, we're placing our trust in God. And we're letting God work through us. We're letting God become part of the situation. We're releasing him over the whole situation. And when that happens, because we have to give him the authority to come in, because we actually have dominion over the earth. So we have to call him into the situation. And when that happens, nothing can stop us and nothing can stop him. Let's, let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for your word. Thank you for this seemingly simple key that unlocks the amazing power that you've given us in the Holy Spirit. Help us to understand that, to, to grasp even just a little glimpse of what it means when we walk in love, when we put others ahead of ourselves, and when we step boldly into situations, just as we know that when we love, we can face you boldly on the day of judgment. Not arrogantly, not self-servingly, but boldly with confidence the way you have made us to be. Thank you for this. And give us the strength, Lord, to go about this week out in the world as love-bearing lights to all those we come across. Thank you in Jesus' name.